Okay, so we're back to our usual uh, discussion. And this time we're going to talk about uh, chapter 26. And this is the topic on concurrency. Why do we need concurrency and the details on uh, how, uh, what is concurrency and how it is implemented. So this chapter is uh, more of an introduction on a concurrency. So uh, as a main background is that normally when you write a program, uh, your program will be single threaded. So you have the main, so you have the main function in your C program and the instructions in that main function will be executed sequentially. So the execution is called a flow or execution path. Right? So there's a single flow of execution. Now it's possible or there is a need to be able to have multiple execution paths, right? So by having multiple execution paths, then we can do things in parallel and somehow improve the execution of our program. An example of this will be, let's say you have a very large array and you would like to get the sum of this very large array. A basic approach to solve this, to find the sum of this array is to use a single program and iterate over the elements of the array. Let's say 1 million or 10 million elements in the array. So you, hope you only have one execution path starting with index 0, 1, 2, 3. Right? So imagine that. So you, you perform actually a, a linear uh, traversal on the, on the array, and that will take some time. Now, what if you have multiple threads that can compute partial sums of the array so that uh, a single thread will not have to go over all the elements in, in the array. So you will have multiple lists, uh, multiple threads that solves, uh, that computes the partial sums of the array. So basically that's the idea of concurrency, right? So you can speed up things. So let's discuss uh, the details of, uh, of this, okay? So, so what is a thread then? So a thread is uh, is basically a new abstraction for single for a single running process. So the idea of uh, uh, recall that processes is an abstraction, right? Now we drill down further inside the process, and we can create another abstraction, which is called a thread, which is basically just uh, we can say that it's the smallest unit of execution. So union threads is basically a, a new abstraction. And it's possible now, nowadays to have multi-threaded programs. Now, you might wonder, what if I have only one processor? Right? So the idea of concurrency is somehow to execute things in parallel. What if I only have uh, one processor? Will I be able to have multiple threads in a system in hardware with one processor only. Of course, yes, you can do that. How? By uh, 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 let's call this papalit uh, palit. So you uh, switch you switch one from one thread to another. Okay? So by doing that, uh, even though you only have one one core or one processor, and you have many threads. You go, you go, uh, you switch from one thread to another. So, this is very similar to CPU scheduling, right? However, the main difference is that in CPU scheduling, you schedule the entire process, but here you schedule schedule a thread, which is, is smaller compared to the process. So that's the idea of multi-thread program. So I will I will give an illustration later. So it has uh, multiple paths of execution. And as I said, it has uh, basically it has multiple uh, program counters. When you say program counters or the instruction pointer, uh, this indicates kung nasa ana yung execution dun sa thread, right? So remember, for example, sa processor we have uh, sa x86 we have the instruction pointer. So basically, yung uh, uh, sa isang process, pwede kang magkaroon ng multiple threads because you can have multiple program counters, right? And actually switch, switch lang siya from one thread to another. 
And what's the main difference between a thread and a process? Uh, yung thread, meron siyang, uh, sinishare niya yung address space ng process kung saan siya nagbibilog. So remember na yung address space is associated to a process. Okay? Kung meron kong isang thread, yung thread na yun, sinishare niya yung address space. Diba, single thread na yung application mo. Nasa loob siya ng address space ng process. But if you have multiple threads inside the process, nasa isang, uh, nasa isang address space lang sila. Now you might wonder, Paano mo ngayon, sir, masasabi na unique yung thread kung nagsishare siya ng address space? Paano mo masasabi na unique siya? A thread is unique from other threads. Unang-una, yung bawat thread, meron siyang sariling uh, program counter na sinasabi kung nasaan na yung state of computation niya. Okay? And addition, so basically, in addition to the program counter, meron din siyang yung, ano, yung register set, yung context, uh, context ng, ng thread similar to the context of a process, right? So, uh, with the introduction of threads, yung scheduling natin will no longer happen at the process level. Yung scheduling natin will now happen at the thread level, right? So, each thread has its own program counter and a set of re registers, and one or more thread blocks or thread control blocks are needed to store the state of each thread. So, Dito ngayon napasok yung TCD or thread control block. Uh, sa process, meron tayong process control block, di ba? And nandun yung state ng process. So dito, meron tayong thread control block, which actually is smaller uh, in terms of, of size compared to the actual uh, process control block. So magkakaroon na ngayon ng switching ng threads instead of switching ng processes. So when switching from uh, running uh, from running one thread one to another to, to running the other thread D2, ano yung mangyayari? So the, the technique here is very similar to CPU, uh, CPU scheduling. Right? So the register state of thread one will be saved, and then the register state of thread two will be restored, and then the other space still uh, from, uh, remains the same. Right? So ganun yung... Uh, scenario na to. Makikita niyo yung namin pag pinagpagdinemo ko na sa inyo sa isang sa isang example program. Right? So may, ito halimbawa isang process may dalawang thread so nag switch switch lang siya right? by storing the state of a thread to a data structure called thread control block. Okay, so let's have uh ano bang mga issues dito? Hindi ata yung ginawa ko. Okay, so Okay, so yan, yun na yan. So the next one is uh, how does it look like? Right? So in this figure, we in this slide we have two figures. On the left, we have a the address space of a single threaded process, and on the right side, we have the address space of a two threaded process. So as you can see. This is one entire address space. Now, by default, all programs, actually, if you don't use a thread library, there is always one default main thread, right? That there is always one default main thread. That is the main flow of execution. And that uses the main stack of the address space. So given this setup here, where, where, where we only have a single threaded process, isa lang yung stack niya, okay? Kasi remember, the stack is used to contain the local variables, arguments, routines, and the return values. So, nandun sa stack yun. Kung isa lang yung thread mo, isa lang yung stack mo. Okay? Now, if you have two threads, you're going to need multiple stacks for each thread. Right? So, in addition to the in addition to the thread control block, to the state of the thread, each thread also needs to have its own stack, okay? So yun yung gagamitin niya. So in this case, yung thread 1, ito yung ginagamit na stack, and thread 2, ito yung ginagamit na stack. But remember, these two threads exist in a single, it exist in a single process address space. Okay, malino ba yun? That's what I mean by, by that, by one stack per thread. Uh, 
pipe natin. Okay? So, why do we need to use threads? As I mentioned earlier, one is for parallelism, which speeds up the computation, and another one is to avoid blocking a process's progress due to slow I.O. What do we mean by this? Remember in the previous discussion that a process uh, will be running, will be will, will have instructions for doing computations or uh, the, the CPU burst and then the I.O. burst when doing, uh, when waiting or when performing I.O. Okay? For a single process. So, so a single process is an alternation of uh, a sequence of CPU burst, I.O. burst, or combination of those two. Now, what happens is that if you have a single thread only, when an I.O. burst happens inside the process, the CPU is sitting idle, okay, waiting. For example, you have a CPU burst and then an I.O. burst. So the, the thread running on the CPU burst will have to wait for the for the completion of the I.O. So in that way, the CPU is idle, it's waiting. So why not within the same process, if the program requires another operation, why not have another thread that will make use of the CPU burst while the other thread is waiting for the I.O. completion? So that's what we mean by that. So it enables the overlap of I.O. and computations within a process, right? So instead of just having one CPU burst, you can have a CPU burst for thread one, CPU burst for thread two, CPU burst for, for, uh, for thread three, right? So an example would be spell checking using a background thread in a word processor, right? So you probably use this in your POMSI 22, right? That's, those are the two main reasons why we use threads. I'll show you an example later. Okay. So here we have an example, a thread creation example. So programmers will have to take advantage of uh, threading by explicitly, by explicitly incorporating threading uh, in their code, basically by using an API, which is the topic of the next chapter. So here's an example of a basic a thread creation program. So this is an example code uh, from the book, but instead of showing you this code, I'm going to just uh, demonstrate this. Okay. So this is this code here. So let's take a look at this T0.c. And let's explore the code, right? So in writing a multi-threaded program, first you need to have what you call a thread function. Right, so this is the thread function. This is what the thread is going to do. So in this case, it simply just prints whatever uh, is passed to it, as shown here. And this is the main program or the main code. It's the main function. So here you have two threads, P1 and P2, which actually a P thread underscore T. And then yeah, you print main. So Take note that there are actually three threads in this example. You have the main thread and you have threads that run these thread functions, right? So there is always the main thread. Please remember that. So this one, it will create uh, a thread, okay? Referenced by uh, P1 and then this will be the thread function and this will be the parameter that will be passed to the thread function. Eventually, this will be stored on the thread on the stack of this thread P1. And the same also, we created a thread, thread P2, and this one is B, right? And then uh, this call, this uh, join call here, uh, P thread join, means that uh, the main thread will wait for the completion of this thread P1 and thread P2 before eventually exiting, right? So we can try that and make, uh, this is how you invoke the code. So you have to link it with the P thread library and then 
this is the uh, execution that will happen. So this is the main thread. This is P1. This is P2. So notice that in our program, in our program, a, uh, P thread create actually for A was created first. But when we run this program, it's in a different order. Right? So that's the idea of threads because uh, it might happen that the scheduling will uh, happen uh, differently. So you can see here the discre discre not necessarily the discrepancy, but this is the default behavior if you don't have any mechanism of synchronizing this. So here you have a main begin, it's the standard, and then BA. And then on our next run, we have AB. So this is the effect of thread scheduling. So going back to the slide, uh, I will show you, I will, uh, what is shown here are the possible execution paths, right? So as shown, as demonstrated in this code, right? So we have the main thread, which is the main function, thread P1, thread P2, and this is what happens, right? So this is the timeline, decision pass. So main starts running, begin and create thread, create thread two and waste 41. And the scheduler uh, waited until this point, waste 41, before actually selecting thread one or thread P1 to execute, right? And then wait for T2, this is one execution path. Right? Now, it's also possible to have uh, multiple uh, execution paths. Uh, another execution path. So we have execution path two, which means that it might happen that right after creating thread P1, the scheduler selected to schedule thread one immediately. Right? So this is what we get. Right? And then after thread one returns, thread two was created and it was scheduled immediately by, thread, by the scheduler, thread two. And then waste for T1, right? which returns immediately because thread one is already finished. And then also waste for T2, the main thread, and then uh, returns immediately because thread two is already finished and then prints make the end. Right? So we have print A, B. Still, uh, this is what goes up under the hood, but what we only see are main A, B, N in the output. But it's also possible this case, right? So we have main begin, uh, uh, B, A, N, N. This is what we've observed in the example that. So depending on the scheduler, it's the execution, which thread will be executed is dependent on the scheduler, right? So some, somehow we don't have much control right, on which thread will be executed. Right? But we are, we are guaranteed that everything will start, of course, in the main thread. Right? So I hope that's weird. So why so many possible execution paths is because of the uh, scheduler. Right? So you have this. So that's why uh, sometimes uh, concurrent programming is very difficult because if your code is dependent on a particular execution path and you did not properly uh, provide or uh, incorporate in your program the so that the correct execution path will happen then you get erroneous results right so that's why it's very hard to program uh, concurrent or parallel programs because of these issues of multiple execution paths. So let's talk about, so another, uh, so that's one, right? So just, we just demonstrated an example illustration of different execution paths. So the next one is shared data, right? So before we proceed to this, let's recall our lab exercise on shared memory, right? So in that lab exercise, we have two processes one process A, another process B, and they're trying to access a shared memory for matrix computation, right? So there we have two different processes, process A and process B. And in order for these two processes to be able to share the matrix, you have to set up a shared memory, 
Okay, so that is quite difficult because you're uh, you're allowing uh, processes, right? In in this example, in in sharing of data in in, in threads, right? Since the threads reside in the same address space, right? Looking at here, looking at these address spaces, right? Since the threads reside in the same address space, whatever is in the data, okay, in the address space, in the heap or in the in the data, but not on the stack, will be accessible to all the threads in that particular process. Right? That's one thing to remember. So sharing of data in threads is easier compared to sharing of data uh, among processes. Right? So you have here an example, code. Right? This is the code that is available in the check. B -I -B -C. Okay, so this is the code, the uh, same code, same code as the, the same code as this, uh, right? So what we have here is a shared counter, counter, this counter here. And this is the thread, the, the CPU burst, right? This is the CPU burst that's going to, uh, manipulate this counter here. So this is the counter. So this counter is accessible to all the threads, okay? So uh, let's look at the code and let's look at the thread code, right? So this is what's going to happen inside the thread, right? So you have a percent uh, S, uh, it will display this argument, the, some letter, look at the name, We'll see it is A, a okay, same process, but it tries to increment a counter, okay? Basically, counter equals counter plus one. We'll discuss this later, okay? But this is what it does, okay? And this is the uh, main, uh, main thread, okay? So what happens here is that two threads will be manipulating, will be incrementing this uh, counter. Which is initially set to zero. So let's see how how uh, it will uh, run. Okay, so let's say ten thousand. Say ten or one hundred. Say one hundred. So it seems that the example executed correctly, right? Beginning with counter zero, A, be, uh, A begin, perform is incrementing, and then B be, began also, perform is incrementing, counter is 200, and they expected it should be 200, right? So, but what if we increase the number of iterations? Two, three, four, five, six, seven, like this, right? So, as you can observe, okay? Right? Notice the scheduling that happens here, right? So in the first, in our first run, we have A, A, B, B, supposedly the correct, uh, correct process. But here we have A, B, A, B, and we get a different result for the actual value of the counter. And this is what we should be expecting. Let's try this again. All right, so this time we observe that the scheduling happens B, A, B, A. And the result is still wrong. This should be 20,000, right? So you see the discrepancy here because of the scheduling, right? And they're accessing a shared variable counter, right? And this counter, okay? So here, uh, this variable is actually stored on the stack. So this is stored on the stack, I here. So you will notice this discrepancy because of the scheduling, right? So here, what happened? So why is that? Right? That is because of what we call uh, a critical section. Right? So in this example code, we have what we call a critical section. 
In our programming language, we have counter and uh, counter. This is the code to uh, to increment counter or basically counter plus plus. You can use that. But if we compile that and we create the assembly code for that, this will actually be composed of three instructions, right? So this first, uh, this of course, it in the syntax. So this is the address of counter. Okay, so you move whatever is stored in the address of counter into EAX. You add one and you store back EAX to that counter. So thereby incrementing, uh, incrementing the counter. However, since we have these different execution paths, it's possible that during a thread switch, thread context switch, some operations might be uh, missed out, resulting in resulting to incorrect results. Okay. So another note on this example program is that this one, right? Remember that this is a thread. If I'm going to ask you a question, where is this i int i variable stored? This int i variable stored will actually be stored on the thread stack for the given thread. So as you can see in the example, the example run, this value here is the address of i in the thread stack of b. And this one also is the address of i in the thread stack of a. So i is located in different locations, okay, uh, in different locations, in different thread stacks, because we are running on a thread. Right? So that's one thing to remember. If you want to share data, across threads, you have to place them in the global variable or you have to place them on the heap. Right? So I think your lab exercise actually uh, demonstrated that. So in, you, in order to return a value from a thread, you have to store that value on the heap and then return the pointer. Right? Return the pointer out of, of the thread to be to be uh, received by p thread join okay so that's an important uh, uh, thing to remember okay so so this is what happens right because of this uh, because of this critical section a race condition occurred when you say a race condition the result depends on the execution path the correct result depends on the execution path, right? So as shown in this example, let's say we have a counter initially set to 50. We are expecting that result of 52 after this increment, right? Because thread one will increment 51 and then thread two will increment 52, right? That's what, what's, what is supposed to happen. But since we have threads and the scheduler, uh, we can't control the scheduler, uh, we cannot finally control the scheduler. So this is what happens. So we have the critical section. So let's say thread one was selected by the scheduler. So it executed this instruction, uh, this move instruction, and then this next instruction, right? So this is the this is the state, part of the state of the thread, right? The register, AX. So initially zero yung EAX, and then since nag-move tayo, ito yung counter, itong address na to, ito yung counter. So nilagay natin, so AAX that will be 50, and then we add one to EAX, so AAX now will become 51. Then there is a context switch, right? So let's say the, the timer uh, the timer expired, so nagkaroon ng interrupt. So another way ng OS, ng scheduler, is to save the state of thread one. So currently, Yung EAX, the part ng thread ng thread 1 ay 51 ang nakalagay. And then, ibabalik niya ngayon yung state ni thread 2. Since first time pa lang mag-run mag yung uh, thread 2, ito yung state niya. So, kasama din sa state actually yung, ano, yung program counter. No? So, ibig sabihin, uh, this is the last instruction that was executed for thread 1. Now, for thread 2, 
Ganun din. So, ang mangyayari, e-execute nyo to. So, currently, mapansin nyo dito sa execution na to, si 51, si counter, hindi pa na-update nung sumingit si thread 2. So, pag binasa, pag, pag in-execute in instruction na to, ang malalagay sa counter ay 51, ay 50 pa rin. Ay, sa thread 2, 50 pa rin kasi hindi na-update eh. Na-interrupt yung pag-update. Hindi natapos uh, completely yung dapat yung part ng critical section. Ay. So, ano nangyari? So, natapos sa, compared sa thread 1, sa thread 2, natapos yung lahat ng critical section. Ay, lahat ng part ng critical section niya. Ito yung tatlong instructions na to ang pinatawag na critical section. So, hindi dapat siya ba, ano, uh, nakompleto siya. So, na-store niya yung 51 dito sa, ano, sa, sa counter. So, natapos na siya. So, in-execute na ngayon yung, nag-switch na ngayon ng thread to thread 1. And yung next instruction sa thread 1 ay yung pag-move na. Okay? So, ang nangyari, since ni-restore yung state ni thread 1, So yung state niya ay 108 so this is the last instruction to be executed and then yung current value ni AAX which is uh, 51 okay so ang nangyari in store niya doon sa counter sa memory location na yon so remember na yung memory location na yun ay sini share ni thread and thread 2 51 pa din right so that is the result of array condition so this explains why uh, We have different results if we have uh, a very long and uh, long uh, count here. Because when it expires, the ano, time slice ni thread one, magsu swap na agad siya, and you will have a different scheduling and you will have uh, different results. Because it's different. Ano, uh, na interrupt siya somewhere down the critical section. Okay. So I hope that is uh, clear. Okay. So that's called a race condition. So. Be very careful when you are professionals, uh, when you're writing multi-threaded programs. Make sure that whenever you, you write parallel or concurrent code, you do not introduce race conditions in your code. Okay? So what else? So the critical section is a piece of code that accesses a shared variable and must not be concurrently executed by more than one thread because executing it might result to a race condition and thus to incorrect the source. So, yun yung nangyari kanina. So, the solution is to support uh, what we call atomicity. So, all instruction executions in the critical section will not be preempted for critical section access. So, the technique is called mutual exclusion. So, dito sa example natin, kung hindi lang, kung hindi lang in-interrupt, si thread 1, hinintay na ma-execute itong last instruction ng critical section, wala sanang problema. 50 to sana ang lalabas. Kaso, hindi pa nga tapos yung critical section, na-interrupt na agad siya ng scheduler. So, that is the problem. Okay? So, uh, how do we then uh, accomplish that na kung saan magagaranti natin na lahat ng instructions dun sa critical section ay may execute atomically. So the technique, the solution is to introduce special hardware instructions as well as operating system support. So we have here balance, uh, the same example. So uh, the abstraction actually developed for this is what you call, uh, which we will discuss later, are called locks. Okay? So parang sa bahay, kung hawak mo yung lock, ikaw lang ang, kung CR ka, for example. Okay? Kung si CR ka, kung hawak mo yung lock, ikaw lang yung magamit ng CR hanggang lumabas ka. As long as you hold the lock, walang ibang mga kagamit ng CR. So that is uh, the abstraction that's being introduced. So this is another abstraction. So a thread will not be able to execute in the critical section unless it holds a lock. Ensure that any such critical sections section executes as if it were a single atomic instruction. Parang yung increment na yun, uh, isang ano lang, isang instruction lang. Okay? So, bakit hindi nila mag-provide yung hardware ng ganun? Sometimes, yung ibang hardware, meron ganun, yung iba naman, wala. 
So kung naga somehow additional circuitry pa yun sa hardware, so mas maganda, may mga simpler instructions, which we will discuss later, how to implement this lock. So how do you use the lock? So dito, ang gagawin lang natin, we define a variable lock T, mutex, and then ito yung critical section. Before, uh, before ng critical section, maglalagay tayo ng lock, mutex, and then after ng critical section, unlock, mutex. So parang dito, example na to, ito yung ating critical section, dapat meron tayong lock mutex before itong counter of counter plus one and then unlock mutex dito sa after itong counter equals counter plus one. So yun yung basic idea ay right, ng locks. Okay? Ngayon na ba yan? So, so in addition to that, we have uh, condition variables. So yung condition ng variables naman, in addition to the lock obstruction, ito naman ay ginagamit for synchronization. Okay? Kasi meron tayong mga concurrent programs na parang may dependency na kailangan magawa muna to or may event na dapat nagawa muna na nangyari muna bago yung next thread ay mag-execute. Okay? So dito ngayon pumapasok yung condition variables. Okay? So some problems will require waiting for another thread, basically synchronization, and for example, threads for I.O. processing. So yung sinasabi ko nga kanina, no, na yung isang isang uh, isang CPU burst ng isang thread, naghihintay ng result ng I.O. So pwede kang mag-run ng C CPU burst ng thread 2. Okay? Kung may dependency sila, pwede kang gumamit ng condition variable. So we have uh, other problems like bounded buffer, producer consumer, reader writers, and then it was the problem, which is actually your lab exercise. Okay, so is this the last slide? This is the last slide. So I will give you some code examples no, on how to view this uh, uh, multi-threading, how to experiment with it, right? So uh, how to view information about uh, these multi-thread, multi-threaded examples, right? So here we have, uh, Ito yung nasa, ano, nasa lab. Nasa lab nyo, no? Yung klase nyo. So, meron tayong sample1.c. Bi, sample1.c. So, ito yung code ditong, uh, yan. So, example lang to ni Ma'am Berna and ni Sir Chris. So, minodify ko lang to just to... Uh, put an infinite number of hellos here. Okay. Put an infinite number of hellos. And, uh, uh, yeah, so, let's um, restore all terms. So, i-run natin to. Okay, sample1.elf, na build ko na kanina. Ito yung output niya. We can actually use uh, a command in... This is the command line in Linux para makita natin kung ano yung mga threads na nagraran para sa sample na to. Okay. So it can just uh, it can be you, this one will output the PID, the thread ID, the percent CPU and the processor a particular process is running, a multiple process is running. So dito sa left page makikita niyo na itong hello uh, sample1.elf ito yung kanyang process ID, okay? Now this process ID Actually, is a multi, uh, this process is actually composed of several threads. So you will have the thread ID here. Yung, mapansin niyo yung PID, pareho nitong thread ID na to. Okay? So this thread ID is the, th the thread of the main, okay? the main thread. Ito yung value na to. Okay? And then, this will just be the threads of, the thread ID of the other threads. Okay, malino ba yan? So you can use this command line para makita nyo kung sa... Tapos, makikita nyo dito kung saan processor nagraran yung thread. Now, itong, itong VM ko, meron siyang dalawang cores. So makikita nyo na yung isang thread, when it comes to thread scheduling, palipat-lipat siya ng processor. Okay? So this is an example of thread scheduling na kung saan yung isang thread ay ini-schedule sa iba't ibang processor. Although you can pin diba? yung task set, pwede naman natin gawin yun. Okay? So how do we debug this program? 
So you can actually debug this program. Uh, to examine the characteristics of the threads. Uh, I-debug natin tong PID na to, 18361. Ano ko tayong syntax ko, 18361. Hindi siya, kailangan natin ng process name. Okay, so ang syntax ay sudo gdb process name process id. So makikita niyo dito, nasa loob tayo ng gdb. No? We are inside gdb and we see this lwp. Lwp is sometimes uh, uh, re is a reference to threads. So lwp18362, okay? lwp18363, yan. So, yan yung ano, yun yung thread ID din. Okay, so LWP thread thread lang. Okay, this example. So, this so nagraran tong process na to, nakahook tayo, so nagpost siya, okay? We can use the command info threads, okay? To check on the So, here we can see the uh different uh stack frames for this particular uh, uh for this particular for the threads okay so you can see that each of this uh thread okay will have different uh stacks okay so yun yung different uh different uh yung main ano niya, main characteristics niya okay so info thread so Inattach natin yung ating ano yung ating uh, GDB sa ano sa sa process na sample L. Tingnan niyo uh, uh, nag-stop na rin itong ano scheduling, okay? So nakapin na sila sa ano sa isang kasi nag-post na yung ano yung run niya, okay? So you can see the information about uh, the threads, okay? And then if you look at info proc mapping so nakita niya dito yung uh, yung stack dito sa uh, process address space niya. Okay, so yung mga stack na yon ng threads, yung mga local sa kanila ay nandoon sa uh, nandito sa ito, itong location na to. Okay. So, yan. Somewhere here in the stack. Okay, so you can experiment with this. So, if you press Continue. Yeah, may continue na uli yung process and yeah, may proceed na siya. Okay, so there. That will be uh, all for uh, for this uh, video uh, lecture. Do you have any questions? Uh, do you have questions? None? Okay. So, uh, okay, good. So, sana maintindihan nyo, no? Kasi very important ito. Uh, kasi pada baka nalilito kayo sa lab nyo, paano gagawin, okay? So, pwede nyo i-debug yung code nyo using, uh, using, using this approach, okay? Para mas maintindihan nyo. So, uh, siguro sa real-world example na lang, uh, yung events halimbawa, so pag kinontrol sinyo yung main program, mapansin niyo mag mag nag-stop din yung ano, mag-stop din yung ano, mag-stop din yung uh, yung yung mga threads, okay? So remember na yung threads nasa loob ng process. Pag kinil mo yung process, lahat ng threads sa loob ng process na yun ay mawawala din kasi yung mga threads ay nagbibelong sa isang address space, address space, okay? So halimbawa itong events, yung events dito ay yung PDF viewer ko, okay? So pag tiningnan natin siya, Meron akong dalawang instance kasi ng ano dito ng ng events. So ito yung kanya ano, ito yung kanyang uh, ito yung kanyang structure. So ito yung dalawang instances ng events tapos meron siyang uh, iba't ibang threads. Okay? So makikita niyo ngayon and you can attach a debugger para makita niyo kung ano yung properties nitong mga threads nito. Okay? So that will be all. Do you have uh, for this particular uh, 
uh, lecture, start ko lang yung recording. Meron ba kayo ngayong tanong sa ano sa 